Okay, um, part two of the our World of Ideas review on video because this is such an invigorating learning environment. Um, full disclosure before we get into that, just thought I would let you know very important uh, news. My wife and I watched Frozen 2 the other night for the first time. It's a good movie. Um, not quite as inspired as the first one as far as the music goes, although I will say that the rock cover of Into the Unknown by Panic at the Disco is the best pop version of a Disney song released probably in the last 25 years, and I've had that thing playing on repeat on my iPhone or whatever I can get on my computer, and my kids are screaming it at the house. It's actually pretty epic, um, and I've been letting it kick me in the teeth for the last 24 hours, so... Congratulations for them actually letting somebody besides Selena Gomez cover their songs. Um, anyway, that's an aside note. We can talk about that when we get back to school eventually. All right. So we're going to pick up with uh, the ideas of like really Christian, what Christians like to see, and really where the foundation of that is found in Scripture. Um, so number six, question six says, where, does, where in the Bible do we see an early example of a representative government? The, the earliest example that, that is a clear leadership position where representatives are employed is in Deuteronomy 1, 9 through 18. Moses um, gets the people to choose wise leaders from among the tribes, and he appoints them as leaders, and they trickle down the, the orderly commands for actually managing um, rule in Israel. Now, Israel was a theocracy which meant that as a nation, they were supposed to carry out God's decrees. We don't; Those, those don't exist anymore. The only functional theocracy um, was Israel, and because of man's sin, even that was screwed up completely. That wasn't God's fault. Um, generally now, what you see in a theocracy is a very, very destructive form of government which oppresses people and, and drives one particular agenda. And it's, it's, I can't think of an example in history where it wasn't incredibly corrupted. Um, so um, with, I think it just goes to show how important like a representative government is functionally in this world and how God's designed that, because even in his theocracy, he had representatives where God's, uh, we talked about this in um, the, the homeschool Bible group, but where God's mediator, so the go-between between between God and man, Moses, actually had other mediators below him to just carry out the orders of the day. Now, I think you could argue that the church, uh, as defined in Timothy and Titus, actually has a type of representative government. And some, some of you guys aren't going to like this. I go to a church that's led by elders, and these elders represent the people, and they represent the functioning uh, like spiritual growth of the church. So we kind of have a representative government there. Some of you guys have deacons, and uh, I mean, yeah, people say it's a wonderful form of government until we find that they're complaining about the way the deacons run the church up, like every other Sunday. Um if it's done right, though, the elders and the deacons form, form representative governments in the church. And I think Paul uh, describes that in 1 Timothy and Titus when he tells the pastors, choose elders from among the people. Let them, rep uh, let them run the affairs of the church. Let them uh, be in charge of the teaching and the spiritual development of the church. So I think we see it in the Old Testament and the New Testament. What are, uh, number seven, what are two reasons why representative government is a wise form of government? Well, it distributes power. Um, if a group of people is being accurately represented or taken care of by their representatives, um, other groups of people aren't going to be able to take them over. And secondly, it forms mutual accountability among the rulers. Think about this. You have, and, I, and this is a big oversimplification, but one president has ten people who represent various people groups to him. The one person, number one, represents, say, the state of New York. He represents just in one city, uh, what, 9 million people, uh, 10 million people maybe? Uh, and then, say, rep representative number five uh, represents the state of Wyoming. I don't know that Wyoming has a million people in it yet. It might have two. The Wyoming's biggest city has 60,000 people in it. It's twice the size of LaGrange. It is tiny. But what's funny in, in this situation is both have one representative. It distributes the power. That way, 9 million people can't just swallow up the little state where the capital is only 60,000 or the little state of 2 million people. 
So uh, that's kind of an oversimplified way that it works. That way you distribute the power, one voice versus one voice. The people aren't overrepresented, the people aren't underrepresented, and it, I mean, you still have to wade through the differences and have to use some wisdom and common sense, but it, it's not like the, the city of New York sends 100 represented to the, to the president and then this, this whole state of Wyoming sends one. Um, that, that would be the, and I know America's like electoral college is a little more balanced on, along those lines, but it's still not that extreme. So that's how the representative government works. People bring, uh, you have a smaller group of people bringing the concerns of the population in general to the, um, the lawmakers and the rule makers, and the, so everybody gets a voice. The civil rights movement in, um, 20, the, in the mid 20th century of America, I think, is a, a, is a time when representative government won out that a minority group of people finally got the finally got the recognition and the citizenship that they had a legal right to. Um, so that's why representative government is good. Number eight gets into some really sticky territory because you're. <laughs> I, I'm taking this class in seminary. We're teaching this class at our church based on uh, another seminary that does this. Um, and this is one of the examples that they, they pose a lot of examples. Like, what would you do in this situation? So number eight says, what's the principle of greater command? And where do, where do we find examples of this in Scripture? They're basically looking for, if you're giving a moral uh, law to obey, is there a time when it becomes the, the, the moral thing to do to break that law? For example, uh, and this is the one that always drives people insane, if you were hiding a family of Jews in, during the Holocaust, and somebody comes, you know, knocking on your door and says, do you have Jews in your home? Do you, if you're a Christian, lie to them? And that lie leads to the arrest and capture of these Jewish people. Or do you, or that lie protects the, the Jewish people, sorry. Or do you tell the truth that leads to possibly the murder of innocent people in your home? Because lying is a sin. Telling the truth is not a sin, but the consequences is even worse. And so a lot of people will argue, and I mentioned like Norman Geisler and uh, Wayne Grudem, they will argue that there's the issue of a greater command. Um, and there are a couple of times in Scripture when you see that. Um, basically that when there's a command to like say, thou shalt not kill, um, and, and then there's a command that says like, don't, like, don't tell a lie, which is an oversimplification of thou shalt not bear, bear false witness against your neighbor. Then, then it's more important to obey uh, obey the, the command that doesn't lead to somebody's death than it is to be so so committed to the truth that um, it ends up harming folks. That's really an oversimplification of it. And if you get into some of the really nitty-gritty debates, in fact, I might throw this out at you. If we do a Zoom, like get together, uh, play kind of an ethical what would you do and just see how much y'all hate each other when we finish the conversation because it's really complicated. There are a couple of places though where there is a first and greatest command that we always adhere to. That is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And the second, Jesus says specifically it's like unto this. So as you move towards loving the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, you should follow the second command as well. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you love your neighbor as yourself, it will help you it will help you approach loving the Lord your God with all your heart and all your strength. And if you love God the way you should, you will love your neighbor as yourself. So they're interconnected. Okay? And now listen, you don't love God by loving your neighbor. Because some people you you, you guys love your neighbors to the point where you hate God. That's terrible. Um it, it's it, they're they're interrelated. Um, but the first and greatest command is to love God first. So Examples of scripture where you should obey the greater command, love the Lord your God. Rahab in Joshua 2, where she, through faith in the Israelite God, lied to people in order to protect Israelite spies. Okay? Rahab is seen as a person of great faith. More so, the Hebrew midwives in Exodus 1, and I don't care what Wayne Grudem says, um, and we've had this argument at church, so if you, if some of my students that actually go to Fountain Church will know what I'm talking about. Um, like the, the Hebrew midwives were told to do something. They were told to kill the, or the Egyptian midwives were told to kill the Hebrew babies 
And the Hebrew and the Egyptian midwives said, uh, the Hebrew women are just so like in such good shape that as soon as this, they go into labor, out comes the baby. We can't get to him in time, and the babies are already gone. The, the midwives lied to Pharaoh. They intentionally concocted a story to deceive Pharaoh into letting these ladies off the hook and um, protecting these children. Now, I don't think that the Hebrew that the midwives were praised and rewarded because they lied. They were praised and rewarded because they had faith in God. They, their sin of lying was passed over. And so in that case, you kind of have a situation of where there was a greater command to follow. And also the uh, apostles in the book of Acts in uh, chapters, I think, 4 and 5, where the Sanhedrin says, stop preaching the gospel. And he's like, look, you can do whatever you want to to us. We can't stop preaching, preaching Christ. And so they followed the greater command. They obeyed God rather than the commands of, um, of men. Okay, uh, moving right along because we're running out of time. Uh, Christians are called to do what five things in relation to the state and those in authorities? We are to obey government authority. That's Romans, uh, it's Romans 13 right there. Um, now, beyond that, we are advised uh, and have kind of determined over Christian history what to do. Number two, we pray for those in authority. Number three, we, we in America can appeal to those in authority in the face of injustice. Ezra, I mean, Esther is a good example of that, where she goes to uh, King Azaharis on behalf of the uh, Hebrew people. We can, number four, practice careful civil disobedience in the face of injustice. Uh, that would be protesting uh, sit-ins. That would be telling folks to the government that says you can't worship, say we're going to worship anyway. Okay, disclaimer, not the same thing that's going on here. And we've seen uh, in news accounts uh, of a bunch of churches that have just decided to meet anyway and have gatherings of three to 400 people because they're like, well, you know, we're Ronnie Howard Brown says we're, we're going to revive, uh, raise up a, a generation of revivalists and wherever, you know, going to take over the government. No, that's, that's people being dumb and prideful, okay? When the government, like it does in China or North Vietnam or, or North Korea, says, Christians, it is illegal to meet, you can't meet, that's when you say, mm, forget it, we're going to meet. Okay, so there's a difference there. This is what we're living in is temporary. If it goes into something permanent, then we might have to talk about civil disobedience. And finally, number five, be, in, be involved in politics. There's nothing wrong with a Christian being a state representative on any level in um, American politics, and there's nothing wrong with that in general. Like, scripture doesn't tell us to stay out of it. All right. Number 10, when is it proper for Christians to engage in civil disobedience? When the commands of man force us to disobey God. Okay? And it's as simple as that. So if church is outlawed, yeah, then it's probably time for civil disobedience. When the people say, stay home for your health and don't go to church because there's a disease that can kill people, that's not civil disobedience. Just do what, do what you're told. Um, and if, a, you know, I, I told you earlier that, that I've been involved in a place where we were under curfew. Um, and while after Hurricane Rita hit in Louisiana, we had a 6 p.m. curfew. And we're like, well, there's daylight. We need to be working. We need to be helping people. It's like, no, there's a curfew for your protection. Go home. And if you don't go home, you're going to get thrown in jail. You're going to get a $300 ticket. Um, again, that was temporary, so it wasn't horrible. And there was no reason for civil disobedience then. So there are some times where the government takes measures for protection that we need to obey and be a good witness because we are in obedience to them. Um, but there are other times when they clearly violate Scripture that you have to say enough is enough. Um, and there's a lot of wisdom and a lot of sacrifice that goes into that. Finally, what three ways can Christians be involved in politics? First, study the issues in casting a careful vote. You guys will get to do that when you're 18. Study the issues now. Be informed. Second, um, some of you might run for political office. Get involved in law. Get a, get a uh, political science degree and go for it. And, and find people that will um, support you. Uh, and third, some Christians may serve in non-elected offices. Um, there is nothing wrong with Christians being in leadership. Now, I'm not this whole seven mountain person where we have to take over the government. But by all means, if God has called you to be in a place of office, uh, in a place where you can influence and lead a community for the gospel of Jesus Christ, do that. All right. All right. You guys uh, hit me up with questions. If you have any, uh, study this, go over your notes. I will give you a new writing assignment tomorrow. Just look for it on RimWeb and Google Classroom. Uh, and for now, y'all stay safe, be good, and best of luck. Take it easy.